Welcome to episode six of Electrifying AI, a podcast series focused on the electric power industry. My name is Simon Hughes from SAS, and I will be your host today. And as in our previous episodes, I'm joined by our resident industry expert, Sal Gill. Hello, Sal, and Welcome. greetings from the UK. Welcome back, everybody. Nice to see you again, sir, and I hope you are well. Um, just to remind everybody where we're speaking from, I'm, I'm here in the northwest of England, and Sal, where are you? I'm still in Phoenix. He's in Phoenix, Arizona, everybody. He's in the desert, and I'm, in, I'm on a wet rock in the Atlantic, and, and it's winter. Um, and, every, and everyone is obviously envious of me, right, because uh, I get the nice weather now. Yeah, you do, and the long days. It's already dark here in the UK, and it's only five o'clock. Um, well, we're into December already, and we're running out of year, can you believe? And I don't know about you, Sal, but I'm looking forward to the Christmas holidays this year, and, and perhaps a fresh start in 2021, but what about you? I'm looking forward to my first um, no snow Christmas. Well, yes, <laughs> you, 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 should, you really shouldn't be getting any snow in, in Arizona, but uh, you never know, you never know. Um, well, look, in this podcast series, SAS and I... Sal, Sal? Sal and I keep things pretty informal and, and loosely scripted and, and we explore a whole range of issues and you'll get to hear and see some informed commentary not necessarily from me but almost certainly from, from Sal. And the title of our sixth episode is The Holy Grail, How Energy Storage is Set to Transform Our World in the Coming Decades. And we're going to try and connect this back up to many of the themes and ideas we've been exploring in our previous episodes. Um, so Sal, tell us a little bit about the history of, of energy storage, and presumably if we go back a little time, a little way in time, options were, were pretty limited, but, but in particular, why energy storage is important for the industry and also for consumers? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that humanity, since the beginning of time, has been trying to do is, you know, find ways to save or, or store energy. Right. And uh, especially when it comes to electricity, uh, there has been many different uh, tries that have been made. There's been a lot of experiments that have been carried out to understand how that feat could be achieved. Right. And uh, I'm pleased to share that we're now living in an era where that has become a reality. Okay. Uh, so we can save a per perishable uh, commodity like electricity now. We can we can actually store it. Right. Um, and it's 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 become very, very important, more so now, because as we've discussed in the last episodes, that as we have more of this renewable wave get into the world, uh, grids, um, or grids of the world, and we have this very, very quick coming pace of uh, electric vehicles, or in general, the transportation of the electrification sector. Yes. In, in both those areas, just as those two as an example, uh, one, with the renewable sources, there's variability. There's volatility. We don't know mm -hmm. when they're going to produce at what quantity. I mean, we can try and predict, but there's still this volatility that's associated with it. And for many, many years prior to where we are today in the world with energy storage, uh, that renewable energy that was generated uh, was non-dispatchable. So basically, electricity in general uh, has to be uh, consumed when it's created to keep the supply uh, demand equation in balance. And right. Uh, now that's changing thanks to storage. So what storage does is if there are periods of time when the wind is not blowing or the sun is not shining or there's a cloud cover, uh, storage can kick in. Uh, and, and when I say storage, I mean energy storage. And yes. there's different forms that I'll share in a bit. Um, but energy storage can kick in and provide that uh, cushion or that reserve margin to to provide that stability that may be missing. And if we look at electric vehicles, it does the same thing, but from a different perspective. Right. And it does that by providing extra capacity that the grid may not have at that particular moment in time or location. Um, so that's that's what's really driving the force behind storage. Right. Um, and and if I may, Simon, uh, just you know, energy storage is, is also a very broad topic. Mm -hmm. And there's different types of storages. So we can, um, you know, electricity could be stored um, via hydroelectric uh, dams, as an example. So that's um, a sort of pretty old-fashioned sort of idea. That, exactly. Yeah, you can just right. open the tap and somehow power happens. Um, but there's right. lots of other types, aren't there? Particularly newer ones. Yes, yes. And um, so there's compressed air, there's flywheels, 
And the, the one that I'm most interested in talking about today is uh, battery energy storage. So the chemical form yeah. of, uh, you know, storing energy or electricity. Um, and, you know, just, just a quick comment on some of, you know, you mentioned like, you know, the first one, the hydroelectricity one was slightly more conventional. And, yes. it, you know, that's absolutely the case. And it's, it's not just that it's conventional. It's also, you know, there, there's a huge uh, investment that's needed. Uh, to go on and, and do projects like that, you know, not well, they're huge the infrastructures, that, aren't they? You, you, you've got to block exactly. a river and then build pour tons of concrete, and it, I mean, it takes forever to build a dam. I mean, and, I, and exactly, the, have, the lead have time is much larger. Have, yep. have you been built dams in the last five, ten, twenty years? Oh, no, there, there there have been some, um, right. but it's you know it usually takes a, a really long time to yeah, get those types of projects in place. Uh, but saying that majority of the energy storage in the world today is actually that form. It's pump storage, as they call is it. it. Right. Uh, I think it's like maybe 94, 96% Crikey. Uh, of, at least in the US. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty high number. And the rest of it is, you know, these other different forms of energy Small storage. Um, yeah. So compressed Small air, flywheels, battery. Exactly, exactly. And amongst all of them, the one that's growing the fastest is uh, this battery energy storage technology, and gotcha. and at the heart of it, Simon, it's it's you know it's it's very similar to the, you know to the to to our the the same batteries that are in our iPhones or in our laptops. You know, it's it's that same concept, but what we're doing is we're trying to double up, or you know, we're trying to build a lot scale of those it. small yeah. batteries and scale it up. Yeah, uh, such that it can do much bigger things than just you know power laptops or uh, personal electronics. Got you. So, so the 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 rising interest, if you like, in in battery energy storage in particular is is because we we see these things in our devices and we see these things in our vehicles increasingly, and we have big sort of uh, big firms like Tesla pushing pushing the uh, the battery agenda, if you like. Um, and I can see that by connecting it to um, uh, the renewable. Um, some of the challenges with renewables and the fact that you you don't always build uh, generate power when you when you want to use it necessarily if you store it then the it becomes a much more uh, well, a much bigger proposition uh, so so I under I understand all that um, and I, yeah it's a fascinating sort of moment if you like a tipping point if you will um, you send us a couple of articles actually about some of the sort of impressive um, statistics metrics whatever some of the take up rates if you like for energy storage deployments and and some some really cool stories have, have come through Sal. What, what sort of things are you, are you seeing in these these emerging stories yeah so what's what's exciting is as we covered with some of the other technologies you know electric vehicles um solar and wind you know in one of the episodes episodes we talked about texas as being you know this this fertile ground now for, for a lot of these renewable projects interestingly enough energy storage is growing at that same, if not greater, pace uh, in the market. So the latest results show that uh, in the U.S., uh, mm. for, for starters, we have seen a 240% growth in energy storage projects uh, in Q3 this year versus Q2. And okay. again, this is a pandemic year, right, Simon? So yeah. those numbers are very, very fascinating. Yeah, that is, that's big. That's not a small movement, is it? That's 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 very very substantial. Yeah, and and you had mentioned, you know, um, companies like Tesla who are making you know big bets in this, and it's not just Tesla. There's others as well. But of course, there are. Yeah. One 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 major project that has come up in in recent time is uh, what Tesla is trying to do in California, where they're trying to build the largest energy storage system. I believe it's around 764 megawatt hours um, in total. Right. And, um, and and their goal is not just to stop there. They're even thinking of taking it to 1.2 gigawatt hours. And that, Simon, that type of capacity yeah. could power almost uh, all of the homes in San Francisco. Okay, so that's a, that's an appreciable scale. So these are not small uh, startup projects by any means. These are big scale, mm -hmm. industrial scale provision um mm -hmm. of of battery battery storage my goodness that's that's that that's big that, that's really really yeah. big so this is this is um we're we're moving into a um yeah this isn't just small stuff is it this is this is big big mm -hmm. big big bucks yeah now, behind now it. simon business. let me um maybe let me point out some differences too so yes absolutely the 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 tesla one is you know uh what we call 
uh, you know, utility scale type energy storage right. deployments. So these are large, you know, uh, pr- you know, pretty uh, wide deployments that power like cities and, and things as such. But at the same time, there's also deployments that we call that are happening behind the meter. So the Tesla one, we call it front of the meter. Yep. Uh, there's others that we call behind the meter, and that's residential energy storage. And in our okay. last episode, we talked about you know these electric vehicles coming on, and you know we're going to have to plug them and you know uh, mm. into, into our outlets and stuff. Now, energy storage also has a really neat role to play, even in our houses, especially as we put on more and more solar PVs and get these electric vehicles in. Sure. Energy storage can kick in even for our houses to provide that um, flexibility in trying to meet our energy demands. Got you. So it, so it actually is, is capable of operating at multiple scales, local, small, residential, neighborhood scale, all the way up to sort of big citywide and, and bigger infrastructures. And, and clearly, we're still sort of testing out this sort of te- technology and, and how it plays nice with all the other, the grid infrastructure. I guess mm-hmm. uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a Brit sort of looking looking at what's going on in the US, I mean, Joe Biden's, Joe Biden made a, a big, made clean energy a key policy within his political ge- agenda, Sal. Um, I guess, uh, what will that do to this? Uh, what, what will it do to the, the power industry generally in the next four years? Yeah, uh, President-elect Biden has made a commitment um, of getting the U.S. Um, to be net zero by 2035. Uh, that mm. is a major commitment uh, okay. from you know, the largest economy in the world. Um, and yeah. the, the fact that, you know, at a, at a policy level, we're seeing a shift like that happening in the U.S. means a massive opportunity for not just Americans, but the rest of the world uh, to, you know, consider. Uh, and, you yes. know, U.S. is not alone in this. Uh, oh, no, similar, absolutely. Similar policies, Simon, as we've discussed in our other episodes, have been passed in the United Kingdom and in, you know, Norway, Sweden, um, and other European players, as well as in places yes. like China and 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 um, you know even even in East Asia, they're looking at these uh, types of structures. So they are. So, yes, I, I so, see that the. Um, I was just going to say that the uh, his plans. Uh, normally, California has these really ambitious plans, and everyone sort of tucks in behind them. It seems like he's got a plan that's even more ambitious than the goals that California had set out, and which we absolutely. commented on in our last episode. So it's an extraordinary um, ambition that there is uh, from the president elect. Yeah, and um, you know it's 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 always great when um, policy is matched also with you know what's happening at the grassroots level where you know we've discussed about these prices coming down right. Mm. So now is the ideal time, and, and we've also discussed how COVID has shown that how we can bring down carbon emissions right by not having enough car you know many many cars on the roads or transportation yes. um, taking place. Um, so. All, all that, it, it seems like all the stars are aligning for uh, a, a green or renewable world mm. order to, I think to you're come right. into existence. E- even as an industry novice, it's clear that there is a sort of, as you say, an alignment of the planets or yeah. the stars a- around this issue uh, with the technology enablers and the the policy sort of a momentum, if you like, uh, or right, not just in the US, but right around the world. Just, just, to, um, just to come away from batteries just for a moment... Um, Another um, of the um, emerging, if you like, storage medium uh, is hydrogen. I, I understand, and mm-hmm. both as uh, uh, something you can store, you can store uh, power as hydrogen, and you can then use renewables to generate something called e-hydrogen, some like a renewable fuel. And I know that mm-hmm. the Europeans, in particular, seem to want to go down this path in quite a big way. Sal, um, what can you tell us ab- about this? Yeah, and, and Simon, there's a, a, a diff- you'll, you'll hear different names um, in our industry, but one uh, um, famous term that's being used these days is called power to X. Right. So essentially, the entire concept is that we want to create a s- completely sustainable electricity um, uh, infrastructure. And that's sort of, you know, basically that's been one of uh, President-elect Biden's uh, goals as well, right. where he wants to reduce uh, significantly the emissions from the electricity sector. Yeah. Um, so the the sort of the high level overview of this um, uh, ecosystem is that we have, let's say, a wind turbine or a solar panel that is generating electricity. Okay. All right. Now that's, uh, that's, green or renewable electricity. Now we want to use those electrons 
to do something called electrolysis, where we separate hydrogen and oxygen. Understood. And then yeah. that hydrogen that's separated, we can then go ahead and store it, uh, just like you know we, we we have been storing other gases for you know almost uh, well years more, more than <laughs> years, a century, years, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So so that's that's one element, right? Where we're using this green renewable electricity or electrons uh, to do electrolysis and then convert it into hydrogen. Right. The other element here is that the reverse could also be true, where that hydrogen can then power, um, you know, some sort of uh, a generation equipment, uh, either a fuel cell or even uh, perhaps potentially even conventional generation to then drive uh, electricity backwards, right? So I'm, I'm yes. not backwards, but it's like it's still in that renewable ecosystem. And the beauty of hydrogen is that if you look at, you know, different infrastructures around the world, uh, a lot of the heating for buildings is still, you know, based on uh, natural gas or methane. It is. Now, yes. if, if, if we, you know, if we sort of step out and, and you know, look at it from a 40,000 view, Simon, what if we could replace that gas with hydrogen and use the same mm. infrastructure and be able to supply sort of the same type of, you know, uh, heating uh, end result. Yes. So th 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 there is a lot of interest in that space. And then there's also uh, yes. hydrogen could be used also for, you know, other industries as well. So we can have e-hydrogen, which is could be used as a fuel for certain in industries. The, yes. the oil and gas and chemicals industries <laughs> could use hydrogen for their uh, purposes. So there's, there's different use cases that are emerging. Although I will say that hydrogen is not not there yet when it comes to right. uh, using it for um, electric uh, for for uh, for vehicles or for transportation. Yes, it's the the efficiency is not there versus uh, what we're seeing with uh, battery energy storage technologies. Understood, understood. And I saw a quote something along the lines of, "You know, we can't electrify everything," and and so how some processes will and heavy transport will still have to run on gas, and so the renewable hydrogen is of all the gases, is the best gas because it's sort of clean and affordable mm -hmm. and it's tied to renewables in the way that it's it's sort of sourced. So I, I get that, that that works. But I think the Europeans are putting some really big money behind this, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't I don't have the statistics in front of me, Simon, but I Well, I heard it was a trillion, new, wasn't it? A trillion yeah, dollars? Yeah, it's, it's almost a trillion deal. dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which it's, is it's a, an enormous amount of money. I mean, goodness me. Right. And, you know, I, I see that it's, it's, it's going to catch up in particular areas, right? So there's um, yes. creating hydrogen and, and storing it, you know, and could be considered an almost another form of energy storage in some ways. Yes. Uh, I think it's going to catch up for that. Its applications, though, are going to be very dependent on geographies, on uh, market factors, as you know, what it ends up getting used for. Yes, um, of course. But it's 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 again a very bright spot in the industry, especially in light of you know the the policy uh, decisions yeah. that we're seeing from different governments. So it's definitely part of part of a mix. So batteries are, mm -hmm. are leading the charge, if you like. That's a rather awful pun I've just made without without intending to. Uh, and then obviously hydrogen uh, could could be in, could be in the mix as well. Um, so it's quite clear, even as a you know a relative newcomer to to your industry, that the energy storage is really taking off and is being accelerated by political and sort of economic circumstances and indeed the pandemic, arguably. Um, but so what are the benefits? You know, all of this good stuff's going to happen. So what does the power industry get out of, you know, energy storage? What does it do for their sort of business model? We've talked about business models in the past. And then what would be the upside for, say, consumers? You know, what would the, you know, the regular man or woman in the street, what would they get out of it too? So can you cover both of those for us? Absolutely. So, you know, we've discussed earlier about how this is the missing link, right? So we've talked about variability in renewable sources. We've talked about electric mm. vehicles and coming in and supplying extra capacity when it's needed. Um, so there, there is a reason why, you know, energy storage is qualified as, you know, the holy grail by the industry. Right. Uh, and then, and the, you know, the, the biggest reason is because energy storage as an asset is something that has multiple use cases, okay. right? So you, you buy this asset, you can use it for almost, you know, uh, I, th I think some studies from the Department of Energy in the United States quote 60 plus applications. Um, okay. And we have a That's term a in our industry that we use that we call um, value stacking or even revenue stacking in which we're taking all these different applications, stacking them on top of each other uh, to determine, you know, what the overall 
benefits may be from energy storage. So I'm going to, you know, just share a couple of them. So, the so it's first like layers. One, it's like layer exactly, upon layer upon right. layer. Okay. Yeah. Right. And uh, it'll, it'll come together once I, you know, I, I share some few, mm, that. few, very few use cases. Um, and by no means a storage just limited to these. So let's look at the very first obvious one, right? We have a storm. We have wildfires like we have seen in Australia and in California, et cetera. Yep. Um, and we may be without electricity, right? Uh, we also have an environment where we have microgrids that we've talked briefly about as well, where yep. you know they're, they can come in and provide that resiliency. There is another thing, and that is uh, energy storage. Right, so energy storage could be looked at as a um, as an asset that can provide that inherent or build build in that inherent reliability into grids and not just grids, buildings. You know, right. the beauty of energy storage again being you know it can it can be applied from a from a house to a factory to a Walmart to all the way to you know these big large projects like the one Tesla is doing in California. Yeah. Um, so th- th- that that basically sums up to is that it provides reliability. The other piece with energy storage is that uh, it can provide that reliability and provide it extremely quickly. Um, okay. From a, from a physics per, from a physical perspective, energy storage units are very modular. You know, you can basically um, pick and drop them. You know, wherever you want uh, that use case. You know, we okay. can basically buy them and, and put them in our houses as, as residential energy storage. You know, there will be a nice little slab on the on the wall where sure. these things would uh, hold on to. So reliability is a huge, huge benefit that storage okay. provides. But let's look at some other ones. So the other major one is what we've talked about um, is this uh, congestion that may occur. You know, we've, in, in one of the episodes, we talked about how Amazon has, you know, signed up for a hundred thousand electric vehicles. hundred thousand right? vehicles. Yes. Now, I've I've also mentioned in in several places that you know if you even have three thousand of these electric vehicles all connecting together at the same time using fast DC charging stations as an example, mm. you know we're talking almost the power requirement of a nuclear uh, power reactor. You know, somewhere in the order of a gigawatt to three gigawatts. Right. Uh, or sorry. Uh, um, uh, yeah, that that that's that's basically you know it could that's be sort of scale, it could yeah. be it could be that it could be that big, right? Uh, now the the thing with storage is that storage could be brought in to help alleviate that potential congestion that could uh, exist at that particular node on the grid. Mm-hmm. So if we have an Amazon depot or even a bus depot, you know, a lot of the buses in different municipalities are going electric. And, yes. you know, we can position or place storage given its modularity and its, you know, ease of use or ease of deployment. Uh, and by the way, it's it's extremely fast to deploy too because the lead times are you know it's 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 it's, it's it doesn't take that long you know versus right. building a new generation plant as an example. Yes, absolutely. So um, it can act as something that we call a transmission and distribution deferral. So okay. what that means is you can bring in energy storage and it can help offset the potential investment that you would have otherwise had to make in your infrastructure you know either building new lines or new conductors or adding in you know new equipment energy storage can help offset all that cost by okay. and and do it very um, you know it's it's almost very like a surgical like approach where you gotcha. can you know deploy it where you need it and and, gotcha. and leave it and so it's, it's, so it's very one, cost effective used in that way sort of rather tactical almost Exactly, exactly. So it can it can really help um, prove the benefits very, very quickly. The, the third okay. one, Simon, is um, if we look at it from a commercial and industrial perspective, uh, and this is the this is one reason why I believe you know electricity is something that touches uh, cr- obviously touches cross industries, but a lot of these developments are touching cross industry as well. So mm-hmm. the other big one is um, factories, right? Even yeah. companies like SAS. Uh, Walmarts, uh, you know, even companies in the agricultural space, right? Uh, they all have uh, unique power requirements. Uh, you know, okay. we look at data centers, right? Data centers are huge power hogs. Funny now enough, I was going to make a, that, a, a, that, that, <laughs> that connection, actually. That, you know, you talked about modularity and sort of stitching them all together and just adding a few on. And, and uh, it does, does have a sense of a sort of a server farm or a data center or something. Essentially, yes, yes, it's, it's, you know, an analogy could be made over there. Um, so even with, again, with, with data centers, right, these are, the, these are, um, these are major power hogs as well. And, you know, 
what happens is um, the the load curve, as we have also covered in previous episodes, it changes throughout the day. And yes. at certain times, your demand uh, may exceed your normal or regular demand such that you have to pay an extra amount. Uh, we call it demand charge in the industry. So it's not the energy charge, which is usually measured in uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. Yeah. This is the dollars per kilowatt. So it's basically so it's like an a extra, premium. It's a, it's a premium that you have to pay for the utility to allocate space to send those electrons to you. So it's not consumption. It's the fact that you have such a high power draw that the utility has to, you know, reserve some extra space on the, you know, I'm, I'm again making an analogies here, but it's like reserving some extra space on that pipe uh, that's sending the electrons um, to, to, you know, to dedicate it to you. And it, it costs money for the utility to do that. Gotcha. So there's that extra charge. Now, the beauty of storage in that scenario is that you can kick in storage to save off that or, or shave off that yeah. extra extra peak that you have. And um, oh, so what you do is you kick in storage as soon as you see that you're going to get into that uh, slot. And then storage can come in and shave that off. And in, in many instances, Simon, people, you know, companies can save millions of dollars just by applying that one technique. And, you know, usually the payback in those situations is extremely fast. We're talking, really? you know, a, a year to three years uh, and even maybe even less given the um, given the fall in costs for battery prices. Got you. So there's, there's benefits on both sides of the equation here then for both consumers and generators. Cons uh, generators can, can sort of smooth the, the peaks and troughs of in, in demand that they get, the drawer on the grid, if you like, they can flatten off the peaks, and that adds to a sort of network resilience piece. Mm -hmm. And at the mm -hmm. same time, the consumer gets, you know, um, to avoid, if you like, premium charges by, by intelligently using the power that they've got stored to, well, to recharge their electric vehicles and other stuff, but, but that avoids them being hit with premium price electricity because they happen to be doing it at the wrong time so i can, so it's interesting isn't it there is there is a there is a sort of yin and yang thing going on here exactly exactly and um you know let's let's take that same um uh you know common and extend it to another application where uh you know my my infamous duck curve right uh, you remember the that duck simon curve. i remember the duck curve so yes <laughs> i did like us, a good graph so. <laughs> Making us all hungry here. I was trying to think if we can, you know, make a turkey comparison coming off of Thanksgiving <laughs> here in the U.S. Maybe. <laughs> uh, but let's look at the duck curve, right? So again, uh, when the sun goes away or the wind stops blowing, as an example, uh, typically in, in the case of the duck curve, we're, we're looking at solar PVs yeah. not producing electricity at sunset or, or beyond. Uh, so we have all this load that the grid still has to um, meet. Uh, and, you know, because renewables are kicking in, the conventional forms of electricity are sort of, you know, they're, they're either not price competitive to actually bid into the market and participate in the market because renewables are cheaper. Um, so they, they may not be online and it takes time yes. for these conventional assets to get online. You know, a lot of times of these course. are rotating, uh, it's, it's rotating mass. It has inertia in it. Yes. Now with... With energy storage, the beauty is, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm going to go back to the California example where we're looking at a possibility where storage could power, um, you know, almost all of California, uh, uh, San Francisco's houses San Francisco. for six hours. Uh, it can very easily meet the this duck curve issue that occurs at that, you know, at that sort of um, slope where all of a sudden the grid has to provide all this electricity. And you said you said it's quick as well, meaning that what would ordinarily <laughs> be a sort of ramp up by a conventional yep, generator is, is almost instantaneously on stream because of its battery storage and there's no there's no lag. Exactly. And um wow. you know it's it's Simon, it's just like flipping a switch in our in our houses, right? Yeah. And the light comes on instantaneously, right? It's the exact same concept. Gosh. Uh, except we're applying it at scale. So yeah. that's yeah, yeah, another yeah. benefit. And um, one more thing there, Simon, is if if I sort of go beyond this uh, residential environment and look at you know the wider grid level activities that happen, we've discussed a few times now too that um, in our industry, the the power system equation has always got to balance. So the the supply mm. has to uh, balance the demand or the, the demand. generation has to meet the load. Right. Gotcha. Anytime there is a offset there, we can run into issues. And one major issue that we can run to run into is under or over frequency. Right. So, 
in it, what what's happened is as as storage prices have come down, um, there has also been um, and and not just solar renewables and stuff. So we're getting more of these renewables. So we're seeing um, you know more and more of uh, more and more chances of these issues happening where the grid mm. frequency gets out of sync because yes. again you know those conventional sources may not be at play anymore. Um, so what what happens is when all of a sudden you have a cloud cover and now you have this cloud cover wide area and you have like a massive drop in uh, output from the solar panels, your frequency can get if impacted. Right. And one of the ways storage can help is storage can provide instant bursts of power um, to help to cover get the- that frequency or recover that frequency uh, right. change that may have happened. Uh, and what what's happened is, as a result, that there's been a neat little market that's been created around. Got this. you. So they get paid for that for for, for the intervention. You actually get paid for it, and yeah. it's not just you know these big utility companies that can get paid for it. It's even uh, commercial and industrial customers, and I would argue potentially down the road, uh, and not too far, that even residential customers can participate in that market if they have an asset like this. And it's oh, I see. Uh, you know because you're basically waiting for the signal to kick in and provide that uh, that reserve frequency uh, margin that the Don't grid you. may be lacking. So it's, it's created an opportunity. And a couple of years ago, uh, PJM, which is a market um, in the United States for trading electricity at wholesale, they um, did an analysis and it, they, it, it, they found out that you know these new, newer assets like energy storage, in particular battery energy storage, they get compensated three times more than conventional assets that are fossil really? fuel driven. And the reason, Simon, is sort of going back to this fact that, you know, it's instantaneous power. Whereas with the conventional assets, you know, you have this lag. So let's Take say time. somebody yes. sends a signal that, you know, I need I need this much, you know, power at this time. There is a lag to get the, you know, the, the, the conventional sources running and, you know, operating at a, gotcha. a particular speed or... Uh, rotational uh, velocity. So and there's actually with good, storage, good money to be made here. Then there is a, there is a sort of business, exactly. a business model, if you like, can be be built around this sort of interventionist power supply bursts of of supply to equalize the the, the grid. Um, that can yep. be a lucrative si- not a sideline, but it can be a lucrative line yep. of business in 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 the first place. So, so Simon, in the interest of time, I'm going to p- yes. pause there with our four applications. You know, again, I mentioned there could be like, you know, there, there's, there's 60 plus applications uh, with, with energy storage. Right. But I hope this gives the audience, you know, just a glimpse into the, the, the massive potential this technology has and why it's being referred to as the, as the holy grail. And, and you yes. know, the other, the other important part I wanted to mention here, Simon, was we talked about value stacking, right? We're talking about 60 plus applications, right? You mm-hmm. know, Simon, where my mind is going? My mind is going towards advanced analytics, right? Well, I was going to ask how you going to yeah. How are you going to optimize all these different, you know, uh, value streams, right? How, how are we going to optimize? Like, how do we know when is the best time to use energy storage for reliability versus when is the best time to use energy storage for frequency regulation, right? There's market dynamics. There's well, you know, yes. storms, wildfires. There's all these different variables. And it makes it a really interesting uh, analytics problem to solve. It's a fascinating problem. I was going to sort of finish up this because, again, like you, I'm, I'm just slightly conscious of the time. So it seems that we've got technology enablers, key technology enablers and developments which are reaching a maturity now where they, they have a real potential to change the world, uh, particularly the grid. Um, we've got political momentum moving in the right direction. So there's this big sort of bold new vision for the power industry, not just in the US, but sort of worldwide, it seems. Uh, and, and yes, with my SAS hat on, and as I say, I'm, I'm a relative novice to the energy, the power industry, it does seem that this this is a an analytically led well, moment. Um, there is a high degree of interconnectedness between generators, consumers, all manner of, of different devices and types of power. Uh, there's a lot of monitoring that's got to happen. It feels like it's very data rich, um, that it needs to be analytically informed. Uh, in, we've used the phrase optimization before, and without boring our audience, optimization has a certain connotation within sort of statistical and, and analytical circles, but it does mean sort of holistically solving a, a conundrum with lots and lots of constraints fed into that. Um, also, Sal, it feels like a real-time problem. And what you're talking mm-hmm. about there is, you know, power 
not outages, but shortages in are a real time problem that has to be fixed now. I mean, it can't wait two hours. We got to do it now. So this like this feels like there's a sort of an intelligent brain working behind the scenes here to to really optimize how this will 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 work. It's to, something to do with well, it's it's I suppose the world would might be agility, something to do with grid. Mm. A consumer mm-hmm. device agility. Um, I mean, is that the way you see it? Is that is that what's what what you think is going to happen here? A hundred percent. This is going to be needed in real time, um, mm. which is why you know we started off this season, Simon, by saying that um, one of the most exciting things uh, I do is you know look at how do I uh, bring these the the, the biggest machine uh, humans have ever made, which is yes. our, our electric power world. Uh, with the greatest enabler of our time, which is analytics, and mm. I will, you know, I, I would, you know, love to end the season by saying that without the application of advanced analytics, uh, a lot of this future um, would be, you know, challenging to achieve. You could Might still not be do realized, it, yes, but you won't be getting the optimal output or the optimal solution. Uh, and you know, advances in artificial intelligence are are truly going to open up a whole world of possibilities in our space. I mean, just looking at this little energy storage example, you know, if we could have an, oh, yeah. um, you know, AI brain in that uh, control uh, for, for that energy storage uh, device that is able to, you know, make these decisions in real time, like you said, I yes. mean, the, the possibilities are endless. They truly are. And it's a fascinating sort of thought process and, uh, uh, sadly, we are a little bit short on time, so we, we don't really get the opportunity to explore it very much more. But we'll leave our audience hanging, perhaps, Sal, and leave, we'll, we'll tantalize them with this idea. And perhaps we need to uh, we come back to it, perhaps, in, a, in another episode. Um, well, everybody, that, that marks, if you like, the end of our, our podcast, today, podcast today, but also it's the end of our series, Sal. Oh. Yeah. Oh, well. It went by fast, <laughs> didn't it? Just, I mean, we set out to uh, to record six episodes, and 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 this is our, our sixth episode. So now we have, um, but don't worry, everybody, we will be back in the new year with a second series, and this is where we'll we'll pick up the conversation once again, and hopefully we'll touch on these themes and many more. We hope you've enjoyed today's podcast and the others too. We've had a lot of fun putting them together for you. Uh, many thanks for all the positive messages and supportive uh, message comments we've been we've been receiving. Uh, that, that's all great stuff. Uh, and, and I guess all perhaps that remains is uh, to wish you all a, a very happy holiday season because we are in December after all. And best wishes from Sal and I to, for, to all of you for, for the new year for 2021. Uh, and we'll see you again in 2021. So, so thank you for joining us today. Please come back and see us again soon. And until then, it's goodbye from me, Simon Hughes, and also from Salgo. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.